In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sprasnikom on our feast day, the second Pascha of the parish, St. Nicholas Day, which is for us December 19th on Joe's wall calendar and Joe's garage calendar and uh, the 6th of December on uh, the church calendar. I uh, gave a sermon at the liturgy, but unfortunately I didn't press the play button. So I wanted to say it again and be a talking head here sitting in a hotel room in Huntsville before I go to dinner and talk about something that I think is quite important. Two things about St. Nicholas. One is that his gospel reading, for those who are liturgical geeks, is uh, not expected. The gospel reading for a hierarch is from John and is about the Good Shepherd and the sheep. But that's not the gospel reading given for St. Nicholas. It's the Beatitudes from St. Luke. So this is very rare. Usually a hierarch has the gospel reading from St. John about the Good Shepherd in both Matins and a similar one in the same section for liturgy. But St. John has the gospel reading in Matins that is the same for all hierarchs. But the Beatitudes from St. Luke. If I were to think of one word which describes St. Nicholas, it would be holiness. He was holy. He was recognized as holy when he was living on the earth. People thought of him as a saint, even when he was still alive. So he was holy. And the Beatitudes describe holiness, describe the path of sanctity. Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye that hunger and thirst, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Now we see icons of St. Nicholas that show him either very stern if he's dealing with soldiers that are trying to execute someone unjustly or slapping areas. But usually, other than those times, he looks just gentle and meek. Well, when a person is gentle and meek but also filled with the Holy Spirit, of course, that's what brings about true gentleness and meekness. Then he also has great capacity for feeling the needs of each others and responding to them. So I guarantee you, St. Nicholas wept a lot. I guarantee you he wept every day. When he was alone in his closet, he was weeping. Weeping for those around him. Weeping for the entire world. And now he's laughing. We must learn to weep like St. Nicholas. Of course, we venerate the saints because we find their accomplishments to be so amazing. But although if we just do that, then what good is it to us? We have to try to become like them. St. Nicholas is a great example of the kind of person we should be. Just look at his personality. Of course, he didn't want to be a bishop, but he was found out because of his obedience and uh, by God's will, when he was the first one to come to church early, early in the morning, he was selected to be bishop, and he accepted it. And truly, he was meek, and he was holy, and he prayed, and miracles happened when he prayed, but he also was strong. We know the story about St. Nicholas slapping Arius, so literally by his hands, the church was saved. Because Arius was really a smart, smart cookie. He, his words were oily, and yet they are darts. We're getting a lot of oily words right now in Ukraine. A lot of oily, oily words, but they're darts. I hope we can have another Nicholas rise up and slap those that need to be slapped. So Arius was speaking, and he was very smart. And remember, rhetoric was quite important in that day. It's not so important now. I guess it's probably less important so much because we, we look at everything in a sound bite on a smartphone. But in those days, entertainment was to see someone preach for two hours and preach beautifully. And Arius was very good at preaching. And people were getting convinced. And Nicholas couldn't bear this. So what did he do? He slapped Arius. Of course, he was deposed for that. But the next day, because of a vision of all of the bishops of the council, he was restored, and that really probably was what turned the tide along was, of course, St. Uh, Athanasius the Great and his uh, beautiful expositions and uh, testimony in the council 
members of St. Nicholas and St. Athanasius were contemporaries and were in the first ecumenical council. So Nicholas was meek and mild, but he was strong when he needed to be. He's also known for helping those who are unjustly accused. There's a story of him saving some people from being unjustly executed. He got right in the middle of it. So St. Nicholas has courage, but he has restraint. He has wisdom, things that we don't have. But I especially want to point you that in the, that in the direction of understanding that he wept. We need to weep more. We don't weep enough. We need to weep. Most people weep over their life circumstances, things they don't get, things they want that they don't have, relationships that are broken, etc., etc. St. Nicholas wept over souls that were broken. All of the great saints did. And we must learn to do that as well. But I really want to talk to you mostly about an epistle that we didn't read today. It's the epistle that's appointed for Wednesday, but we supplanted it with the epistle that is for St. Nicholas's feast day. But it really describes St. Nicholas partially. You know, have to use a little bit of uh, imagination here, but not a whole lot. So it's in Hebrews, and it says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of those things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. The law is a shadow. Now, St. Paul talks about the law a lot. A lot of people don't understand it. And people that didn't understand his writings and were separated from the church or left the church fell into grave heresies regarding the law and regarding works and such. The law was a tutor. St. Paul says, it was to tell us stuff that we should already know. It's really terrible when you are, have to be told something that you already know. We should already know to be kind to our brother, to not steal from our brother, to not commit adultery with our brother's wife. Why? Because we should love our brother. If we love, then we don't need to be told all those things. But because people were barbaric and far from God, God had to tell them, really simple things and that's what the law was for but the law was a shadow of good things because the law was just things like don't do this don't do this don't do this if you look at the commandments the law is just nine don'ts and one do so they're just legalistic things do this don't do this don't do this don't do this and the one that is the do is the honor your father and mother but the law is just a shadow the very image of those things is not in the law. Now in Christian law, the great law is the great commandment, to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and with all your strength. And then the second, which is like it, is, is to love your neighbor as yourself. Upon those two laws hang all the law and the prophets. Now love is not a shadow, because God is love, and God is light, and there's no shadow in God's light. So if a person loves as God loves, there is no shadow. No longer is there the shadow of the law. There is the Christian law, which is perfect. And St. Nicholas didn't have these shadows. He was recognized as holy in his lifetime. In the vigil service, Father Nicholas gave a little sermon about one of the stikera that the children kind of laughed at because it had the word hoary in it, which means, you know, gray hair. And it spoke about how his intellect was illumined. Now, the word intellect there is nous, which is the highest faculty of the soul, the mind, to be able to actually know God. And our nous is darkened because of sins, but his wasn't, because it is living righteously. And so there was no shadow in St. Nicholas at the end of his life. There was only the image of things to come. Now, for us, it's still shadow, and we have to struggle to be rid of so much of that darkness. But one of the things that's so wonderful about celebrating a saint like St. Nicholas is that we can just for a moment sit in his holiness and realize that he's a man just like us. And he, by the force of his will, with God helping him, by the grace of God, but his response to God's grace, he became holy. So we can too. And we will no longer have a shadow 
but a image of the things to come. There's another thing from this epistle that I want to mention because it's so incredibly uh, Christological. What is the center of our faith? Well, I guess you could say the Holy Trinity, right? But the answer that I'm looking for now in terms of our worship, what's the center of our worship? Of course, the Eucharist, right? The Eucharist is everything to us. The blood of Christ, the body of Christ coursing through our veins. Why is this so important? Well, blood was very important in the Old Testament. Blood was used for one thing. It was used for forgiveness and for cleansing, but not for healing. So people could be forgiven their sins by blood sacrifices, but they didn't get better. The blood of Christ not only remits our sins, forgives our sins, but also helps us to get better. That's what's so spectacular about the Eucharist. So let's listen to this a little bit. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. This is speaking of the blood sacrifices of the Old Testament. But this man, Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. This is why we take the Holy Eucharist as often as we can. This is why we prepare for it carefully. This is why the, it's the center of our worship and, and the climax of the Divine Liturgy, which of course is our most important worship service because we take the blood of Christ in us. And this blood of Christ is not only for forgiveness. That's only a small part of it. It's for healing. It's so that we can have no longer the shadow of things in us, the shadow of the law, the shadow of righteousness. Instead, we have the image of things to come, which St. Nicholas attained in this life. The last thing I want to tell you from this uh, selection from Hebrews, which is 10, uh, 1 through 18, is the Lord says this, I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. I will put their laws into my, their heart excuse me, I will put my laws into their hearts. If God's law is in your heart, that means God is in your heart. If God is in your heart, then only light is in your heart since God is light. If only light is in your heart, there is no darkness. There is no shadow of good things. There is the image of the good things to come. This is what we are aiming for in our life. This is the purpose of our life, to have only light in our heart, which means only God in our heart. And God is in the process of, with our permission, putting his law in our hearts. Now the Christian law, remember, is not a, a bunch of do's and don'ts, etc. The Christian law is to become like God and to love like God. Everything hinges on love. And St. Nicholas was certainly an apostle of love, just like John the Theologian. And because of his love, he had the courage to act decisively when he needed to, and he wept, and he prayed. So let's try to emulate St. Nicholas by weeping at night and praying, and by struggling to remove that shadow from our hearts and having only the image of things to come in them. God bless you. Sprasnikom on the feast day of St. Nicholas. Amen.